Hello, and welcome to another episode of Lunch with Lakers. My name is Ryan Palm, and I am from the alumni office here at the Hearst. Today, we are joined by two guests from our admissions and enrollment teams. Joe Howard is our vice president of enrollment, and Christian Beyer is our director of undergraduate admissions. They are both Mercyhurst graduates and are excited to join us today to talk about their experiences in the alumni office, what it means to be in admissions during this COVID-19 pandemic, and the outlook for Mercyhurst enrollment going forward. I often begin these episodes by sending a warning of sorts to ask our participants to bear with us due to technology glitches. Today we had a glitch, but it wasn't a technology glitch, it was simply a mental glitch, as I forgot to hit start record until we were part all the way through the introductions for Joe and Christian. So today you're gonna to skip right ahead to the start of the conversation, but I wanted to let you know that they're both Mercyhurst grads. They both have had really fascinating journeys here at Mercyhurst in enrollment and are two of the most dedicated and passionate people that walk the halls of Mercyhurst. We're incredibly lucky to have them on our staff and I am excited for them to join us today in our third edition of Lunch with Lakers. So we'll start kind of with the big question of the day, which is kind of how your workflow has adapted uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I would imagine it's changed quite a bit given the amount of face-to-face uh, -face interaction that your teams do respectively and obviously with the, the high number of students who come to visit the campus. So I, I thought maybe if you could just tell us a little bit about how the day-to-day -day has changed and, uh, and how we're going from there. And we'll start with you, Christian. Yeah, so we're going on about a month I believe from working from home. This is the first time I've put on a, a collared shirt and a tie. It's, it's nice to know that they still fit. Um, <laughs> but just like anyone else, you have to adapt, you know, and adjust to our surroundings. So, you know, I have a wife and two kids. So setting up a home office, basically moving Legos off of the dining room table, setting up a TV as my double uh, monitor, uh, and then balancing everything that comes along with schoolwork and, and those kinds of things. But as far as the office, again, I think everyone's adapted very well. Uh, we work you know, very closely as far as all the admissions units, marketing, financial aid. Uh, so you know, we kind of hit the ground running, came up with a, a workflow for everything. You know, everything that we're able to do uh, as far as reading applications, processing financial aid, we can still do from the comforts of home. And then it was really propping up um, virtual visits, which I know we'll get into uh, in a little bit, and giving the, the students and community that, that feeling of hospitality that we're known for. Wonderful. And how about you, Joe? And I know, Joe, you've been heavily involved in the administrative team on uh, really the, the adjustments that have been happening institution-wide. So you can certainly feel free to share any of that information as well as kind of your day-to-day -day operation. Sure, Ryan. Uh, so President Victor actually impaneled a task force to start looking at this back in January. Uh, so this has been something that there have been contingencies that had been sorted through and talked about going back to that time. I, I don't think any of us quite expected that we would uh, get to this reality, but we had we had some, um, some lengthy preparation in, in planning for that. Our faculty, our provost did an amazing job uh, switching to remote forms of instruction really over the course of a week. And then uh, staff and administrators followed suit uh, right around the same time that the Pennsylvania governor issued a, a, a non-essential businesses be shut down and employees work from home. Our team across the division of enrollment, you know, we have three admissions units, our marketing uh, colleagues, our uh, public relations colleagues, and our colleagues in student financial services have all done an amazing, extraordinary job at, at switching to this new way of working. Um, it's a little different. You speak at a computer screen all day, but in many ways, the, the work is still as social as it was, which uh, when you have colleagues like I do um, is, is really um, rewarding. So I, I'm, we'll get to it a little bit as, as Christian hinted, but the work that admissions has done adjusting to this has just been absolutely extraordinary. They've, they've pivoted uh, quickly and with a lot of ingenuity. So I look forward to talking about some of those. Wonderful, thanks. Um, so I think one of the, the new tools in your tool belt, in a sense, um, is the virtual tour. Many of us who are passionate about Mercyhurst know that the campus tour is such an integral part of, of learning who we are as a community. Um, it's obviously a, an incredibly beautiful campus to showcase, and there's 
saying that I always say, if we just got to get folks to drive through the gates and the campus will take care of itself in some ways. And that obviously is, is far more challenging in this time. Uh, but an incredible virtual tour has been created. And, and why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, that, that was the work of our student ambassadors who recorded the voiceover from their home environments. Um, and then that was uh, overlaid atop uh, existing footage that we had of campus by our videographer in the Office of Marketing and Brand Management. They, again, as I mentioned, the ingenuity and, and um, rapid pace with which our offices pivoted was incredible. That we, uh, we went to work from home on a Thursday and the following Tuesday had a virtual tour launched on online for, for folks to watch. Of course, it's nothing like, as, as you said, Ryan, it's nothing like that experience of getting students through the gates and in the halls of Old Main, but it's a temporary stopgap that it is, um, we're getting a lot of uh, favorable feedback from students on. Wonderful. So for someone who has uh, seen the virtual tour, but perhaps hasn't been to campus yet, uh, what's the one spot on campus that you would suggest they, they must visit when they first get to campus? And, and we'll start with Christian on this question. Well, I mean, my favorite spot is in Trinity Green uh, Park Bench, which I wouldn't be sitting out there very often right now, given the, the snow flurries that we've been having. But from that position, you've got Old Main behind you. You've got Sullivan Hall. You've got the Student Union in front of you. You've got Baldwin, which is a freshman residence hall. And then you've got the athletic field. So you kind of get a, a 360 view of everything. And if something uh, you know looks interesting, or you you know want to go check out a game, it's just a quick walk uh, in one direction or another. So that that to me has always been my favorite spot. And how about you, Joe? Yeah, in terms of things we can't show off, that is just a shame. Is for me, it's the chapel. Uh, that's where every every tour begins in the chapel, and it's used not just to communicate, you know, our religious connection, but to, to communicate broadly the story of the Sisters of Mercy and, the, and the, the incredible women who built our school. So, you know, we start at the front of the chapel, we walk students and their families through the stories in the mural. That's really a, a, a way to ground the tour in the tradition and legacy of the school. And so for me, that's, that's um, a really unfortunate um, uh, thing that we can't be showing right now. Um, that, that is something I look forward to getting back to normal and and getting students and families in there and, and hearing the Mercier story. Sure. Yeah, I mean, you're taking, a, you're taking an hour, hour and 10 minutes typically of a, a physical tour and we cut it down to like nine and a half minutes, you know, virtually. So, uh, you know, you get a flavor of everything, but it obviously is, it's tough to, um, to, to smell, you know, the sights and smells that come along with a physical tour, but we've adapted. Sure, and I would, I would strongly recommend to those alums who are participating today and, and watching the recording of this to please visit mercyhurst.edu. It's very easy to find the, the virtual tour from that, that spot. You can also see so many updates that, uh, that our enrollment team has made to the, up, uh, to the website to showcase the many good things that are happening at Mercyhurst. You can also you know, find all of our academic programs there. You can click around, learn more uh, than you ever thought you needed to about, uh, about the latest and greatest at Mercyhurst. So highly recommend that. So I think it's an understatement to say that the college search process uh, for this spring really has changed um, in, in many ways, probably more so than any of us could have imagined. Uh, I'd be curious for you both to share kind of what are some of the key ways that this has changed um, and perhaps how Mercier's has adjusted our processes in terms of, of test scores and letters of recommendation and any of those different types of things. Um, and Joe, maybe if you can start from a, maybe a little more high level view and then Christian, you could kind of go in the day to day that your counselors are, are experiencing. Yeah, sure, Ryan. So this, this creates a tremendous amount of uncertainty for students in their college search process across the nation, uh, not just Mercyhurst students, but you know, with school districts closing down, with school districts going to remote instruction, um, different, um, different level of services being able to be offered in high schools, we adopted a number of accommodations across all of our admissions units. For instance, getting a transcript out of a high school can be a difficult thing to do these days. So we've allowed students to submit screenshots of their grades from their school's student information system or a photo of a report card or a transcript. And we'll use that to make an admissions decision. Uh, the College Board and the ACT have both canceled uh, their, their spring tests. And so for some students, 
who are planning on using that test to improve their score or to take the test for the first time. We, uh, we uh, leveraged our test optional admissions re review process to allow those students to progress through the admissions pipeline without um, delay or interruption because of those things. Um, those are two of the immediate changes we made. And, and then it's really about how do we work with students and families in this remote environment. I, maybe I'll throw it to Christian to talk about what, what that looks like interacting with families on a day-to-day -day basis now. Sure. And like a lot of schools, you know, we're on a rolling admissions cycle and the national decision day has always been May 1st. Um, many institutions have already made that decision to push that back to June 1st just to give families a little bit more time as they, you know, adjust to everything. Um, I always feel like we, we were ready for this because we've always been a school that's taken a holistic approach with applications. You know, we, we've been a test optional institution for five years now. Uh, we have implemented, you know, um, a self-reported application where students will uh, let us know what their, their grades are. Uh, at the high school level and, and we can, again, as Joe mentioned, kind of move them through the funnel and, um, you know, review everything we need to review. So I, I think we were well um, adjusted and, and ready for that. Um, and then again, just getting students a sense of, uh, again, Hearst is home, uh, giving them what we uh, plan, how we plan to take care of them, showing the parents that, and that's where the virtual visits have come in where they'll, they'll meet with an admissions counselor, they'll meet with a faculty member, uh, somebody in a club or an organization or a sport that they're interested in. So they get that sense of community. Again, it's, that's the most important piece of all of this is feeling at home and feeling comfortable. And, and hopefully as we you know, turn to August and September, you know, we'll be welcoming that new class uh, in with open arms. Wonderful. Uh, can Joe, maybe can you share a little bit about how our student ambassadors are still being used, if at all? I know you mentioned the campus tour, but um, they're such a, an incredible group of our, some of our best and, best and brightest young students. Um, can you share how they're being used in this time? Yeah, they're still, they're still part of the, the recruitment process. So they're not able to give uh, physical tours, but the ambassadors, it's a group of about 60 students um, who make an incredible commitment of time and effort to learn the history and legacy of the institution. They are still participating in family meetings with Christian and his admissions counselors um, when they meet with families. So an ambassador will jump in the virtual visit um, with a student and their family towards the last 20 to 30 minutes of the call and help give that student perspective to students. Um, in addition, they're being used for a number of virtual events Christian and his team and our colleagues at Northeast, um, in the span of two weeks, propped up over 40 virtual admissions events, all organized around different topical areas. And they have a, a, about 40 more virtual events in the pipeline that will be major, major specific uh, uh, in nature. And so ambassadors are participating in those as well to, again, to give that you know, student to student perspective on what the, what the Mercier's experience is like. Perfect. We'll, we'll skip around a little bit uh, from my plan, but Christian, Joe just alluded to the events. Why don't you um, fill us in on, on kind of what the, what's on the docket and how can folks find out more information about those events? Sure. And as you mentioned, mercyhurst.edu slash visit has all the information in, in the different registration links. Uh, so there's the traditional campus tour and then counselor meeting. Uh, but then uh, also we have what's called coffee and conversation. Those are going to be starting actually um, today. We have our first ones uh, with different uh, campus involvement units such as ROTC, uh, campus ministry, band, intramurals, uh, every different. And that's been the great thing about, you know, the, the faculty and staff at Mercy so everyone's willing to help. Um, so that's one part of it where you can learn a, a little bit more about uh, a club or an organization you're interested in. We're going to have Faculty Fridays. Uh, I know you had Chris Mansour on, I believe, last week. Uh, he's going to be part of that with uh, a team of faculty members to um, talk a little bit about their different units and different uh, schools at Mercyhurst. Uh, Mercyhurst on the map is going to be sort of a more of a, a regional flavor. So students from the Pittsburgh area will have a, a session. Uh, students from the greater U.S., Cleveland, Buffalo, Erie County, 
Uh, so again, more of a community base where they might be able to interact and, and meet other students uh, that are coming from their, their geographic areas. Uh, one called Dine with de Departments. So we're, we're big on the alliteration, uh, picking different colleges. And you know, if you are interested in communications, I'm actually going to, to be part of that one as an alum and, and talk a little bit about your experiences and, and outlook and the everything you can uh, get involved in. So, you know, again, and then this is all happening over the next month, 40 to 50 different events. So anyone can go to mercyhurst.edu slash visit and check those out. Yeah, just jumping in there, if you don't mind, Ryan, to give you a sense of how families are taking this up. So today, Kristen and his team have two virtual events with about two dozen students registered between the two events. And on top of that, another 15 one-on-one -on -one visits with students and families, all which involve a faculty member, an ambassador, or a counselor. So the, uh, the admissions traffic hasn't, hasn't slowed down. It's just a different sort of traffic. Well, that's really good to hear. I'm, I'm excited and, uh, and appreciative, certainly, as a member of the Mercyhurst community to both of your teams for all the work that you're putting in to help keep things moving along. Uh, Kristen, can you tell us a little bit about how some of our loyal alums, uh, graduates of Mercyhurst, might be able to help uh, in this enrollment process? Sure, and we thank their their help over the years. I know um, a lot of them have been willing to, to call or text or email uh, a student, whether it be from a uh, high school they graduated from, a uh, program that they're now working in, uh, or from their geographic area. Um, you know, Joe and I are both, you know, loyal alums, but also we, we work for the school. So a lot of times, you know, families and parents want to say, okay, what's, what's the real story? Like, tell us the real situation. And, you know, the alums will say the same things that we do, that it, it, it's a genuine community feeling. Uh, and you know, you're going to meet some of your best friends here. So they just want to hear that sort of, um, candid, um, talk about what Mercyhurst is all about. So I think that's the best advice and best way they can help is just be honest about their experiences and, and what it, Mercyhurst has meant to them over the years. Perfect. Uh, Joe, we'll, we'll give you a question. From a more long-term and strategic point of view, do you think this pandemic will have a lasting impact on the way that we at Mercyhurst and maybe all institutions recruit students going forward? I do, uh, yeah. So I think um, there's a lot of uncertainty at the field level nationally about what college is gonna look like for anyone next year. Um, so I think that those challenges will be with us for the next 12 to 18 months while this pandemic is sorted out. Um, what does that mean for students? I think, you know, some of the early surveys are suggesting more students are going to look to stay closer to home. Some students may be more inclined to take a gap year than would have been in previous cycles. And then for these rising juniors who are really set to launch their, uh, sorry, rising seniors who are sort of, you know, about to begin their senior year of high school next year, everything's sort of up in the air for them because we're not we don't anticipate an, an SET running um, anytime soon. So what does that do for their college going process? Um, so yeah, I think we expect a lot of, a lot of uncertainty and a lot of, um, a lot of change nationally. And I think all universities are sort of grappling with this together at this time. The one thing about Mercier's that has always been true, this has been true since the days that, you know, the sisters were building the school. And one of my favorite stories is, you know, they were building the school and the construction workers go on strike. And so, the sisters figure a way to, to finish building the school. Mercier's has always had that sort of agility and nimbleness. And I think that that served us really well in, the, in these times. One of, the, one of the participants asked a question about, do we see you know, virtual education creating um, new opportunities in future years? And I do think it will. I think that our, you know, as our faculty and students dip their toes into taking online coursework, there may be more of an interest in students taking, you know, an online course here and there throughout their undergraduate career. So I think uh, we'll start to see some of those play themselves out as well. Perfect. Uh, that was a, a great uh, call there, Joe. I, we do have a couple questions in the chat room. Please feel free to send those in. Uh, we'll get to them kind of as we go throughout or at the end of the conversation. So please feel free to send those in uh, anytime. Um, I want to maybe put the pandemic aside for just a moment. It's kind of uh, it's dominated most of our conversations of late, for sure. Um, 
for many of our alums joining today and those that will, will listen to this on recording, can you know the both of you describe some of the new academic programs that we've had? I, I even think since we graduated in the mid 2000s, our academic profile has changed quite a bit in a very positive and innovative way but I think also very strategically. It hasn't been throwing darts at wall to try and add academic programming. And I, I think it's been really successful and, and well-received. So maybe Christian, can you start off by telling us about some of the new offerings of the undergraduate program that have been brought along in the last several years? Sure, um, a couple that you know have been the most recent have been cybersecurity. You know, I know we, we put a lot of investment and in, in time into renovating the first floor of the library to give students a, you know, a more uh, technological approach and that has really paid off um, and I know you had again Chris Mansour on last week that talked a little bit about that uh, but students really seem to be taking to that program uh, risk management is another uh, recent one that we've had um, and Gary Sullivan does a great job of recruiting he he enjoys going into uh, classrooms and talking a little bit about uh, risk management and the opportunities and all the job opportunities within the insurance field. Um, so th those are the two um, that come to mind uh, for me as, as far as the most recent uh, programs that we've been uh, promoting this cycle. Sure. And I, if I recall correctly, I think there's been some, um, as a result of some of this uh, pandemic, uh, issues. We've created new opportunities for our graduates specifically uh, to benefit from some preferred pricing on the graduate level programs. Is that correct, Joe? Yeah, so one of the strategic initiatives from the last strategic plan was was uh, going more heavily into the online graduate space with, with programs that are in demand and career ready. So you saw us launch our master's in cybersecurity two and a half years ago now. Uh, we launched our cyber risk management master's degree 100 percent online two and a half years ago we've totally revamped our ol curriculum to be uh, ol organizational leadership revamped that curriculum to be 100 percent online um, and uh, masters in teaching excellence and a uh, masters in science and nursing which are also available online moving those programs online um, has been good for for students writ large students who are you know trying to retrain while upscaling their their career skills and we wanted to leverage that to also give benefit to our, our alumni. That started with uh, uh, promotional pricing for the uh, organizational leadership master's degree. That's 10 courses um, for alumni packaged at 999 a course. So it's essentially a $10,000 master's degree, about a 50% reduction over what we used to charge in that space. Again, that's coursework that can be completed completely online. You can do it generally in uh, the span of 12 months, 12 to 16 months. Um, but then we went a step further as the pandemic started doubling down and, and we started hearing from alums that wanted, uh, you know, even our current seniors are looking to consider graduate school as the labor market becomes more uncertain. And so working with the provost and our colleagues in finance, we extended promotional pricing across all of our online programs. Um, the OL program will remain the sort of $10,000 master's degree. And then we pursued uh, between 33 and 37% tuition reductions for graduates of Mercyhurst in any of those other graduate programs. That's wonderful, thanks for sharing that. And, and again, our grads on the call can certainly visit mercyhurst.edu to learn more. If you have questions, you can always feel free to email us at alumni at mercyhurst.edu and we'll get you connected with uh, representatives from the the Office of Graduate Continuing Admissions. It's a, they have a great team of people that are always eager and willing to help, uh, to help our graduates. Another question from the chat, um, kind of focused on parents. Um, so I think we obviously work hard to recruit, you know, 17, 18 year olds, um, but oftentimes the parents are as much a part of the recruitment process as the students are. And I think there's obviously some unique messaging sent to that group around, around safety, around the career opportunities, around so many different topics that maybe are new or at least heightened um, during this pandemic. And, and I thought maybe if both of you could share kind of some of your, your input on, on what that situation has been like in inter interacting with parents. And, and maybe we'll start with you, Christian, first. Yeah, I mean, first, you know, to think about either it be graduating seniors in high school or graduating seniors of our students for college, you know, spring is supposed to be, you know, 
the greatest two months of your entire experience, right? You're, you're in your last uh, spring sports season or you're in a production or, you know, you're in a competition of some sort. Uh, you're looking forward to either spring fest or prom or graduation and all of that has been upended. So, you know, we kind of feel for what the, those students are going through and I'm sure the parents, you know, their, their hearts are breaking too for their, for their children to, to not have them go through those experiences. So, you know, what we're trying to, to convey is that, uh, you know, we still have that sense of community where we're not going to be able to replace those experiences, but we're able to show you some of the things that when we do get back to normal that we can provide and, and what that well-rounded uh, experience will look like. And, you know, even if it's just sending out uh, some, some Mercyhurst uh, logos and tchotchkes and things like that, just to, to let them know that we're still thinking about them and, um, you know, we're here for them. That's been the biggest thing. And then obviously, you know, the financial commitment and that's, you know, we're working through that on a sort of case by case basis with families, you know, as they try to grapple with the, the cost of education and, and, you know, am I going to be employed uh, when my children are going back to school in the fall? So, you know, we're being sensitive to that, working with financial aid and, and trying to, you know, make that affordability piece uh, not be the barrier to entry for, for Mercyhurst. You know, we're trying to work with, with families with that. So it's just being sensitive to all the other things going on in their lives and, and trying to be a piece of that. Joe, Joe do you have anything yeah. there? Yeah, I think for me, uh, that safety piece is huge. You know, Mercyhurst is fortunate in that we have a, a very traditional campus. You know, we have a campus that is sequestered from the broader neighborhood and community. And so most of our students are spending the majority of their time on our campuses. Um, that, that, is, that is good from a social distancing perspective versus a school that's in a heavily urban environment where students are taking public transit to and from courses. So having that conversation with families, understanding the nature of our campus, understanding the nature, extensive nature of our support services. You know, we have um, we have counseling staff, we have academic support staff, we have health and wellness staff, staff in campus ministry, who are all still continuing to engage and support our students. You know, we didn't just shift instruction to online. All of our services went online. That includes students are still meeting with their, their therapists in the counseling center to continue therapy from their home environments. Um, that's the type of support Mercyhurst has always been really good at. And, and communicating that to our to, to families and parents can be really reassuring. The other thing I always wanna put in the mix when we're talking with, with parents is what Mercyhurst outcomes are. Um, it used to be the case, it still is the case, frankly, that colleges are sort of judged on their six year graduation rate. So what percentage of your student body do you graduate over six years? Well, that's not acceptable to Mercyhurst. In fact, that was also part of the last strategic plan was really promoting four year on time graduation. And there, you know, that any extra semester you have to be enrolled in school is additional cost. It's additional labor earnings that you're, you're foregoing by not entering the job market sooner. And so talking to students and families about how important keeping students on pace and on time for four year graduation is, and then showing them the statistics around that. We have the best on time graduation rate of any of the colleges in the region. Um, and that extends to many, many in our peer set as well. So really for me, it's, you know, that safety, that sense of community and what that support structure looks like up against what, what our deliverables and our outcomes of our students are. Wonderful, thanks. So I, I think today and, and probably on the recording, we'll have a, at least a few of our graduates who are also, you know, soon to put on the hat of being a parent of a prospective college student. And while we hope and expect they'll give Mercyhurst to look. Uh, we know they may be looking elsewhere as well based on geography and other factors. I'd ask each of you if you could share kind of your one tip to a parent who's going through this process now, whether they have a, a junior or senior in high school, you know, what would you extend to them as a, an enrollment professional to someone going through that process? You know, how best would you advise they, they kind of go through it? And, and we'll start with you, Christian. Um, starting off, I would say continue to cast a wide net. 
Um, you know, I wouldn't discount any school because of geographics or even expense. Um, cause you never know, you know, once you kind of dig a little bit deeper, what might be available for, with financial aid or offering. So, you know, look at a diverse number of schools, whether it be a, a, a city, urban setting, a country setting, a suburban setting, uh, cause you know, it's, again, it's all about that feel. And if you can't physically visit the campus right now, um, try their virtual, uh, online events. And, uh, actually one of our, um, uh, Dr. O, our uh, history faculty member, uh, he, he has a son going through the process right now and uh, has visited quite a few schools and actually uh, made a comment the other day that he found the, the virtual event to be sort of more informative than the physical event uh, because they really have that sort of one-on-one, -on -one, like all of our attention and efforts are put into to you and your family and answering your questions at that time. So just doing the research and, and sort of figuring out your likes and dislikes and uh, and not being um, limited by, you know, certain stereotypes, whether it be a, a, the cost or I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get into that school. Uh, just cast the wide net at the beginning and you can always sort of funnel it down as you go through the process. Very good. How about you, Joe? Yeah, I would agree. Cast a wide net. Uh, give give schools a chance to get a financial aid offer in front of you. Pursue the process with each of them to that point. And then it's it's I think for all alums, you know, the it's considering the intangibles that go along with any given college. So a, a lot of schools are going to have an excellent English curriculum and excellent faculty in this particular area. But what does the rest of the college experience look like? What does that sense of community look like? I think for most of us who who went to Mercyhurst. That, that experience was just as fulfilling, if not more fulfilling than some of the academic endeavors. So really getting that deep sense of what each community's quirks are, what their idiosyncrasies are, what makes them special, um, and, and placing value on that when you're making your decisions. Wonderful, that's great to share. So uh, again, if you have any questions out there, please get them in the chat, we're, uh, we're just about Wrapping up, um, the last kind of scripted question I always ask uh, our guests is, uh, what's your favorite part about Mercyhurst? Uh, and we'll start with Christian. Uh, um, right now, I just miss the, uh, the human interaction like we all do, right? Um, just seeing friendly faces that I've known for years and um, being able to walk around campus on a beautiful spring day uh, maybe go up, see a basketball or a baseball game or a lacrosse game. Uh, so just that, and this is, again, this is always the, the best time as, you know, everything's in bloom. Uh, we're getting to that point. So that's what I'm going to miss if we're not able to get back on campus is sort of that, the springtime uh, vibe that we have because it is such a beautiful campus as we, you know, prepare everything for graduation. So um, just the ambiance right now is what I'm missing. How about you, Joe? Yeah, my favorite uh, part of Mercyhurst, and this is a story I tell quite frequently, um, it's, it's really, it is that sense of community. There is something special about how we interact as colleagues, how we interact with our students, how students interact with one another so that, that is just special and different from other campuses. Um, and the, the way I sort of captured this is, there's a, a sort of tradition at Mercyhurst that's sort of unspoken, but it's a tradition of like holding the door open for other people. You will literally see students hold the door open for another student who's 30 paces behind them because that's just the sense of hospitality we have at Mercyhurst. And you know, in my graduate career, I studied colleges and universities and there is no spirit like that I've ever encountered on another campus. I think that is unique to Mercyhurst when you see it in, in lunchroom interactions and in classroom interactions and in holding open doors and it's just a, it's just a very special and caring community. And so I, um, that, that, that's what makes Mercyhurst for me. That's wonderful, that's, that's very well said. So I, I think that's about it on the questions. Lindsay on our team has pasted in the link where you can go and learn more about the graduate benefits available for our, uh, our alumni. So please take a moment, review that. Um, we will be joined next week by Brian Sheridan, who's a faculty member in our communications department, who's going to talk a little bit about mindfulness in this period where we're all kind of trapped in four walls at home and 
missing as we've talked about some of that uh, human interaction. So I think it's a, a very appropriate topic for, uh, for the time that we're in. You can visit the website that, uh, that's been pasted in there to learn more about past speakers and our future ones as they're scheduled. We really appreciate everyone joining us today. Feel free to share this series with guests, with uh, friends, particularly if you have any uh, you know, neighbors or cousins, nephews who are looking to attend college here in the next coming years, uh, please feel free to share this with them. You can learn everything at mercyhurst.edu. Joe, Christian, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Uh, we send our best out there to everyone to be safe. We hope to see you again next weekend and uh, next week on Wednesday. And until then, carpe diem. <laughs>